Let's take a look at the process for using Creo Simulate for performing structural, thermal, and modal analyses. Creo Simulate is used for two main processes, design validation and design optimization. Design validation is where you figure out what your model is experiencing in its operating environments. In other words, calculating the displacements, stresses, strains, temperatures, modal frequencies, and so on. There are four steps that you're going to take in this process. And the first step takes place outside of Creo Parametric or Creo Simulate. And that step is to identify your requirements. That's where you're going to figure out the different scenarios that you're solving for. And you're going to think about your problem. And I recommend spending a lot of time in this phase figuring out how you're going to simulate your loads and constraints and figuring out those different load cases that you want to run. Step two is when you're going to develop the simulation model in Creo Parametric and Creo Simulate. And that involves sometimes implementing idealizations and simplifications if you have a really complicated model. For example, you might use simplified reps in order to remove features that aren't going to have any bearing on your analysis. Or maybe you're going to suppress components in an assembly that you don't care about. In Creo Simulate, you can create different idealizations to represent components or geometry in your model. Most commonly, these are shell elements, but also you can create beams, springs, masses, and other different kinds of idealizations like rigid links and weighted links. As part of developing your simulation model, you are going to define your materials and there are a bunch of different required material properties. For example, for structural analyses, you typically need density, Young's modulus, and Poisson's ratio, and possibly even the coefficient of thermal expansion. And after you define your materials, you're going to create material assignments where you're going to apply those different materials to components or volumes within different components. You will then apply your constraints, and constraints simulate how the component or the assembly is going to be restrained in the real world from movement. And then you have your different load cases. For example, forces and moments, pressures, bearing loads, temperature loads, gravity, centrifugal, and so on on the structural side. And on the thermal side, you have your different kinds of thermal loads as well. After you have developed the simulation model, you are going to define different kinds of analyses such as static analysis, buckling, steady state thermal, uh, transient thermal, and so on. And after you set up those different analyses, you are going to run them. And the final step in the design validation process is where you're going to interpret the results. And most commonly, this involves creating different pictures, images, and animations. For example, you might have a deformed animation, or you might have contour plots of your stresses or temperatures, or you could have a combination of the two. You could have your stresses displayed on an animated deformed model. So again, the design validation process is about figuring out what your model is experiencing. The design optimization process allows you to improve your model based on these different results. And the first step in the design optimization process is that you're going to identify potential design parameters. In other words, different dimensions or parameters in your model that you think could have an effect. For example, it could be a thickness, it could be a hole diameter, it could be the radius of a fillet. You might have a number of different potential design parameters, but then you need to determine whether those potential design parameters are actually critical or not. And to do that, we're going to use what are called sensitivity studies. And there are two different kinds of sensitivity studies that you can perform, local and global. And with a local sensitivity study, that's usually used to pare down a large number of potential design parameters to a smaller workable number. So for example, you might have a complicated part and you might have 20 different potential design parameters and you wanna figure out which ones actually matter. You can run a local sensitivity study on all 20 of those potential design parameters at the same time and it's going to evaluate your results at the current value of that parameter 
and that parameter plus 1%. It just evaluates them over a very narrow range and then extrapolates the results and will show you a graph. And that way you can guess which ones are critical or not. The problem with local sensitivity is that you could be at a local minimum or local maximum, so you might not get the correct determination as to whether something is critical or not. So that's why you would run a global sensitivity study. And a global sensitivity study is only run for a single design parameter over a potential range, a much larger range. Not that current value and the current value plus 1% like with a local sensitivity study. And that global sensitivity study will give you a truer sense as to whether that potential design parameter is critical. The other important aspect of running the global sensitivity study is that it can help you choose an initial value for when you run the actual optimization study. And running the optimization study is the third step of the design optimization process. And when you're setting up your optimization study, you're going to pick some quantity to be maximized or minimized. And typically in structural analysis, a lot of times this ends up being the mass of the part, but it could very well be something like the modal frequency. Then you're going to select different design goals. So for example, maybe you want the stress be, to be below some certain value, or you want the displacement to be below a value, or you want the temperature to be below a value, or maybe you want a modal frequency to be above a certain value. So you can select multiple different design goals, and then you're going to select those design parameters, which you determined were critical from the global sensitivity studies, you're going to establish a range over which they can be varied, and you're going to establish an initial starting value. And then when the optimization study runs, it will hopefully come up with an optimized model. In other words, the one that meets all your different design goals, plus maximizes or minimizes that quantity that you specified. Let's jump over to Creo Parametric and take a look at an example of the design validation process. All right, so here I have a part open in Creo Simulate. Let's assume I've already done the first step where I've identified my different design requirements. Now I'm on to my second step where I'm going to develop my simulation model. This is a very simple part, so I don't necessarily need to suppress any features, but let's say I had some rounds on some different corners that I really didn't care about, and I know that they were only used to reduce the mass of the part. I could suppress those different features. Also, if I go to the Refine Model tab, oh, one second, let me turn off on my highlighting. Uh, if I go to the Refine Model tab, here is where we can see some of the different idealizations that we can put in our model, like our shell elements, beam spring masses, rigid links, weighted links, and also if I had an assembly, I could use these different weld features in order to join meshes that were uh, end up, ended up with gaps because of shell elements created. So here we have our different idealizations. But let's go back to the Home tab. And now I'm going to start off. I typically do the materials first. One thing I like about the Home tab in Creo Simulate is that you could also just work your way from left to right. You don't have to do things in a particular order. So let's go to material assignment and I see that right now there is 2014 aluminum assigned to this part. That was based on what was assigned on the design side but when I'm running in an, ana an analysis I could use a different material. So if I go to, say, my grant to material database, let's go to our ferrous metals. And maybe I want to test this with a low, low alloy steel. So I can right click and then add it to the model and then click OK. And here I have this different material than I have on the design side that will be used for the structural analysis. Let's click the OK button. Now that I've got my material assignment, Let's put in our constraints to simulate how this is going to be held down. I'm going to use a standard displacement constraint. And in the constraint dialog box, I can change the name of the constraint. You can also create multiple constraint sets. And I'm going to choose to constrain this surface for the holes. 
and I'm going to define them in the global coordinate system. And I'm just going to fix the translations in X, Y, and Z. I'm going to assume that this hole is being rigidly held in the assembly that it is placed. And here we have the rotations, but I'm going to mesh this with 3D elements. So the rotations are pretty much meaningless, so I can just ignore that part over here. So this is good. Let's click the OK button. And so I've got my constraints displayed, and I've deselected them just to show you that you have these different symbols, these icons in the graphics area, and they give you an indication of the different constraints that you have. Just like on the standard side of Creo Parametric, you can use edit definition if you ever want to make changes to your different entities. All right, that is good for our constraints. Now we're going to define our different loads in the model. And I'm going to use the regular force moment load for one of these holes and let's select this hole over here and I'm going to use the control key and grab this one on the other side and I can see based on my global coordinate system I want a load in the downward direction so I would want a negative Y load and I happen to know that my load is going to be in pounds force and based on the rider of this vehicle I'm going to use a value of negative 200 so that is good for my first load now this is just a regular force moment load. There's a different kind of load called a bearing load. And a bearing load uses a non-uniform distribution. And it actually represents the way that some shaft would be acting on there. And it uses a non-uniform load called a Hertzian distribution in which the maximum load is in the direction that it's applied. And then the amount of load decreases out to the sides. And on the back surface of the direction of the load, there's no load applied. So I'm going to pretend that there's a load going off, looks like the positive x direction. And in this case, let's say that my load in this direction is also going to be in newtons. And I happen to know that this is going to be a value of 2,000 newtons. I can enter that value. So you can mix and match the units that you're using for your material properties and your different loads. That's good. Let's click OK. And... Let's just click the OK button. Just saying that, hey, notice is that there's a discrepancy or that this whole surface is not continuous. And it's just giving me a warning that I should check in the results that the actual load applied in the model uh, was the one that I wanted. So those are good for two of the loads. And I'll add one other load in here. Let's define a gravity load. And I want my gravity to also be in the negative y direction. And I can choose, let's say I want, I know that my acceleration due to gravity is 32.2 feet per second squared. Let's enter in the value here. And click the OK button. And so now I've got my gravity load. And by the way, I created all those loads within the same load set. You can create multiple load sets. And when you set up and run the analysis, you can run multiple load sets at the same time. Then when you're taking a look at the analysis, you can turn different load sets on and off. So now I've done the second step. I have developed my 3D model. Let's go on to the third step where I am going to set up and run an analysis. So I'll click on the Analyses and Studies dialog box. I don't have any studies in this model. So let's go to File, and I'm going to create a new static analysis. And let's call this, let's see, this part is my swing arm. Oops, let me use correct characters. It doesn't like dashes. Swing arm static. Can't type today. And here's some nonlinear options, but I'm just going to use a regular linear analysis. I only have one constraint set, so I don't need to combine my constraint sets. Here's my single load set. And for the first time that I run the analysis, I usually use single pass adaptive and just make sure that the results look good. And then when I'm ready to get my good numbers out, then I would run the multi-pass adaptive. But let's choose single pass adaptive. Don't really have any controls in here to change. If I go to the output tab right now, I'm going to output stresses, rotations, and reactions. Here we have a plotting grid of four. If you don't know anything about plotting grid, I suggest that you leave the default and I do not need to exclude any elements. I will click the OK button.
And before I run the analysis, I am going to click on my run settings icon. Just like to make sure that I'm using a good amount of RAM. I have a config.pro option set that will change my RAM allocation from the default 512, which is really low, to 8192 or about 8 gigabyte. And here is the directory that the files are going to be output. That is good. Everything else in here is fine. So I will click the OK button. Now to run the analysis, I can click on the green flag. Ask me if I want to run interactive diagnostics. I always say yes. And it is running. And I always like to display the status so I can keep track of it as it's running. And this ended up running very, very quickly. Looks like it ran in about total clock time was just under six seconds. Now I'll click the close button and I'm ready to take a look at my results, the fourth step. And you could do that from the results icon in the ribbon, but I prefer to do it from the analyses and design studies dialog box because typically I will have multiple analyses in here and I can select the one that I'm interested in and then enter into results mode right from this icon. And now for my first window that I'm going to define, I can use either a graph or use vectors, little arrows for displaying my results, but I prefer the fringe option, which is going to give me a contour plot of the different col colors. And I'm going to first take a look at my stresses. And right now they'll be output in megapascals, but from the drop down list, you could choose maybe PSI instead, or in aerospace, I use KSI a lot, KIPS as they're sometimes called. And for stress, I always like von Mises for metals because it takes all your different normal stresses and your shear stresses and combines them. For the display options, I prefer continuous tone, nine colors is good. And let's deform it. And for the first time, I always like to use a scaling factor of one so I see true displacements. If you wanted to, you could show the element edges, show the loads, and show the constraints. And while we're at it, we might as well just animate it too. So let's click OK and show. And so you, here we see with just having a value of zero, or excuse me, a scaling factor of one for the displacements, we're not seeing that much movement in here. And we can see that we're getting about two and a half KSI uh, in terms of the stresses. If I want to edit the results window, I can go back in here and change from a scaling to scaling factor of 10 and let's turn off the display of element edges loads and constraints and then click OK and show and again I'm barely seeing any kind of displacement in the model here let's go back to the view tab and if I go to the appearance drop down menu and then visibilities this is where you can turn off the display of different things for example I almost never show the coordinate system or coordinate system triad just to make this a little bit cleaner and just so you can see some animation in here let's edit this and change to the scaling back on and now OK and show and now we can see what looks like some actual real movement inside of here. For creating a second window, we could uh, then just copy. A lot of times I just copy the existing one and say, hey, for the quantity here, now let's take a look at our displacement. And in displacement, right now it's in millimeters. Maybe I want to change that to inches. And display options, let's leave a scaling in here. And turn off deformed and not animate it and then OK and show and so there we have an animated window and one that is not and with these, these different windows after you set them up the way that you want them to be you can go to file and I believe it's save it no it's a uh, shoot file print yeah and from here you could choose to output a JPEG image that you could incorporate into a report a quick addendum for outputting a movie of the animated window you can go to file save as and then save a backup and type in a name that you want and for lack of originality I'll just choose movie from the drop down list you can choose if you want to output either an MPEG or an AVI movie so I could choose MPEG and then click the save button and here we have our movie export dialog box where you can choose your output settings and 
how many seconds you want to output or number of frames instead and also other information about the quality and the image size. So anyhow, that is how you generate your different results, and that's an overview of the design validation process in Creo Simulate. I hope you enjoyed this video. For more information, please visit www.creowindshield.com. If you learned something from this video, please give it a thumbs up, and if you like this video, please click the subscribe button to be informed when new videos are uploaded. Thank you very much.